Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ash Sayal. I am a, a small throat entomologist uh, at University of Georgia. And today I am going to talk about insect management for commercial strawberry production. In today's talk, we will uh, uh, discuss season at a glance pests, which pests occur what time of the a year for strawberries, uh, then their management again will take a season at a glance look at the, their management options that we, we have. Then I will get discuss a few select pests in detail in terms of their biology and management. At the end, I will cover some uh, aspects of pollinator management, which obviously are important in strawberry production systems. So take, when we look at uh, a, a, a sort of a season at a glance, the pests of strawberries, starting with the transplant, cutworms and aphids are important here at this stage of strawberries. And when you will look at this uh, season at a glance slide, the leaf, green leaf shows that they, are, they feed on leaves. Uh, strawberry shows they feed on uh, fruit or flowers. And uh, this, uh, these sticks will show that they feed on stems or branches of strawberries. So cutworms, of course, feed on, on uh, stems as well as uh, foliage. If it's, uh, they are sucking pests and they suck primarily on the leaves. Going, moving on into winter, sort of later part of winter, two spider, spider mites, they start, they all go all the way through flowering into fruit group, growth period and feed on, on foliage uh, uh, of the strawberries. Then thrips also, they feed on flowers for the most part during flowering until uh, the fruit, initial fruit growth period as well. Strawberry clipper again feeds on flowers uh, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, smaller fruits. Uh, also aphids again are important this time of the uh, blueberry growing season. Then we, as we move on, lady uh, ligus bugs, uh, on, especially on day neutral strawberries, come into play at early fruit, starting with early fruit growth stage, going all the way till harvest. Then we, during the harvest, we have uh, serious issues, including sap beetles, corn earworms, and spotted wing drosophila. Spotted wing drosophila has become more important for strawberries recently than it has been in the past, uh, as compared to some other berry crops where it has been key pest ever, ever since it was detected in the mainland US. So now we, when we look at uh, a management of those uh, pests instead of a season at a glance look, when we look at post planting, fall to early uh, to midwinter, Crickets are important. We do have a couple options to spray. Cutworms, uh, cyclamen mites are important. We do have some miticide options. Fire ants, obviously we can use those uh, baits that are available here. And this uh, screen that I am showing you now, it comes directly from Southeast uh, Small Fruit Consortium Strawberry IPM Guide. And a number of uh, researchers from the region get together every year to update this guide. So this is one of the best resources for you to learn about pest and disease management for strawberries. I highly recommend, I'll share, I'll show you the main screen and link uh, to access that in the end. So, and then two spider spider mites, obviously we have a number of miticide options. Then we move uh, on to pre-harvest or bloom time, late winter to early spring. Aphids, fire ants, flower thrips, slugs and the snails, strawberry clippers, two spotted spider mites. These are major pest, insect pest or other pest issues uh, of strawberries. And this slide does list uh, options that we have to control them. Then we moved into the harvest period. Fire ants obviously still become an uh, issue sap beetles, slugs, and snails have become serious issues if we don't manage the moisture in the fields. Spotted wing drosophila obviously is, uh, is one of the key pests. Tarnished plant bugs and mites, they are still, mites can be problem 
uh, year round for strawberries. Now I will get into, you know, this gives you a season at a glance look, but I will show you, uh, uh, share with you a little bit of uh, details on some of the select pests. So one thing before I get into annual posticulture uh, uh, practices, do limit many pests of strawberries. For example, strawberry root weevil, cyclamen mites, they do well, this particular system does help minimize impact of those uh, uh, those pests and also root nibbling uh, diseases. Starting with the two spotted spider mite, two spotted spider mites. There, it's, it's very small. They were sort of difficult to see uh, without hand lens. Adults are translucent, greenish yellow to rusty brown or orange red in color. They're about a half millimeter long. Oval bodies of those mites have two distinct dark spots on one on each side, uh, which are which is sort of a, a distinguished fe distinguishing feature to uh, separate these uh, mites from other groups. This is actually accumulation of waste products within the body that is visible through their body wall. Eggs are clear, white, and spherical. Newly hatched larvae have only six legs compared to the eight legs as they go into older nymphs and adults, they develop all uh, four pairs of legs. Uh, two spider spider mites, um, uh, the rate of development is highly variable and it is uh, dependent on temperature ranging from five to 20 days to complete their cycle from egg to adult. So females, basically, they have about two to four weeks lifespan, and the female can lay several hundred eggs during that time, which are enclosed in a fine silk webbing. Eggs hatch in about three days, and then six-legged larvae emerge and undergo through two more things, two mores to achieve the two nymphal stages. And then adults emerge after the second nymphal stage, and then adults, they obviously restart the, the whole process. That whole process can be completed within five to 20 days, depending on temperature and other conditions. Spider mite uh, feeding on the, they primarily feed on undersides of the leaves and sometimes the stems also. They cause initial stippling, which is shown in the picture on the bottom left on the screen, it's sort of a white spots and eventually lead to chlorotic yellowing uh, uh, or sometimes it's called bronzing or graying of the leaves. And in uh, severe cases, necrotic and de defoliation, necrosis and defoliation can occur when populations are not controlled. Leaf deformities, stunted growth, uh, paddle browning, uh, wilt, and reduce the fruit quality, uh, quantity and yield, uh, qu quantity and quality are uh, obviously the outcomes. These mites produce silky webbing and leave behind uh, skin castings and feces that reduce plants' aesthetic value and ability to uh, photosynthesize. Monitoring is, is uh, relatively easy in a plot that is up to 10 acre in, in size, you need to collect only 10 mid-tier leaflets uh, per acre uh, and observe them under uh, 10x hand lens. If the field is larger than uh, 10 acres, then only five leaflets per acre would suffice. And thresholds is if you have uh, uh, five mites per leaflet early in the season, that may be that may warrant application of miticides, or if you have 10 mites per leaflet during fruiting season, then that is when you need to make spray applications to control them. There are a number of options that I showed you in the season at a glance slide as well. Acromite, vigilant, uh, cane mite, nialta, these are effective against all stages of baron, sevi, zeal. They are effective against eggs and uh, juveniles. Uh, portal agrimec, again, juveniles and adults, MP, horticultural oils. These are organic, uh, uh, organically approved products which can be used for organic production. 
Uh, and predatory mites, obviously, are the biocontrol option if, if you want to go that route. The next pest group that I will discuss today is sap beetles. Sap beetles feed on overripe fruit and are attracted to the alcohols produced by micro, microorganisms feeding on this rotten fruit. It, it can be problematic in peach, plum, and apple production uh, systems as well. At least three species of ripe fruit feeding beetles are pests of southeastern strawberries. There are no thresholds developed for sap beetles in strawberries uh, at, at this point. Observe ripe fruit when it's uh, picking surface damage and tunneling. If uh, harvest is anticipated to run long or if a beetle damage is suspected, bait buckets placed at the edge of the field will attract small adults, adult beetles. So that's, that's one way to control that. And cultural control is highly recommended for sap beetles uh, because uh, there are registered chemicals, but those uh, uh, chemicals can uh, cause issues with uh, during the harvest. We don't want to leave too much residues in there. We want to minimize the pesticide application during that harvest time. Bait buckets can also obviously uh, serve as a one cultural control strategy. Trips. Now, trips is another pest that has recently been problematic in uh, some situations, especially these chili trips. They are a serious pest in Florida and have been detected in Georgia as well. I'm not sure the status of uh, chili trips in uh, Alabama, but they are they have emerged as a serious issues. Though both larvae and adults uh, feed on, on strawberries underside the leaves. They have piercing and sucking pest uh, mouth parts. They are originally from Southeast Asia. They have been several times intercepted in uh, the ports in, in Florida and have been established uh, in Florida since 2005. And in strawberries, they have become serious issue since 2015. And now this is one of the key pests or one of the major pests in strawberry uh, systems in Florida. The chili trips, they, as I mentioned, they have uh, uh, piercing sucking mouth bars and they feed on underside of the leaves to suck juice and that, that leads to darkening of the leaflet and midrib as you see in this picture on the left side of the screen that can lead to leaf curling of the uh, uh, strawberries. And the image in the middle shows that severe case scenarios uh, of uh, chili trips symptoms. And uh, sometimes it also leads to bronzing and cracking of the fruit when it's extreme situation. Uh, several uh, studies have been done in Florida. As I mentioned, this is issue in particular is predominant in Florida. So lots of work has been done in Florida and they have uh, uh, developed management programs uh, based on uh, products uh, here. Uh, spinatoram, chloranilipril, and acetamiprid, which is delegate, acyl, and uh, siazepir or XRL. These are effective products for, for management, obviously, broad spectrum insecticides. These all, all three of these products are reduced risk products, which is a, a better option to choose if, if there is a choice, but they'll be slightly more expensive, likely. Then you have broad spectrum choices like bifenthrin, which will be a, a relatively less effective, but can be used in some situations. And there, there'll be less expensive option if you want to go that route. Then we also have some uh, biorational uh, options that can be used for organic or uh, other reduced risk type systems, which include Azera and Microtrol. And interestingly, these entomopathogenic nematodes, when they were applied two times, they provided really good results. So these uh, uh, options are also available for organic uh, growers and also other systems where reduced risk option 
is a desire. Now let's get into spotted wing Drosophila, which is a key pest in most of the berry crops and is becoming increasingly important for uh, strawberry systems. Not only in the Southeast, but across the country, even in California, it has recently become serious issue in strawberry systems as well. It was originally discovered in stra strawberries in uh, California in 2008. 2009, as you see on this screen, sort of an increase a spread of this in invasive pest across the mainland US. 2009, all West Coast and Florida. And then from that point on, it just quickly spread across the country in 2015. We just stopped monitoring it because it was everywhere you looked. A spotted ring name comes from these two dark spots on the uh, uh, exterior margins of the male wings. That's why where the spotted wing name comes from. And males can also be identified using these two black combs as a feature on the front legs. Females of this species are uniquely blessed with this very sclerotized and serrated ovipositor that they use to lay eggs in otherwise healthy fruit. Larvae develop inside the fruit and start feeding and the whole generation from larvae, uh, from egg laying to adult emergence can be completed in eight to 10 days at 25 degrees centigrade, which can happen faster if the temperature is higher. So this kind of tells that this fly can go through several generations in one field season. Over here is just uh, uh, images using blueberry. Uh, we generated this image of how the fruit damage progresses starting from oviposition to basically rottening of the complete unmarketable fruit. It, it takes about three to four days. Beyond that is fruit is not marketable. Overall impact of this uh, fly was uh, estimated to be $718 million in the US. It was estimated in 2014, plus in additional management costs included about $120 million, $129 million which means it's, it's approximately a billion dollar pest when you look at, uh, take all the crops into account. Starting with the monitoring, initially we have used these 32 ounce plastic cups weighted with the yeast sugar slurry, which is uh, kind of a messy, if you leave it for a week, it becomes stinky. And more than that, it becomes really stinky and not easy to manage. Recently, several states have participated in these studies to develop these dry traps, which is a red sticky card baited with these commercially available lures. And they provided comparable results. And we are recommending this now for monitoring of SWD, these uh, sticky, red sticky card based traps. We did monitoring for several years in, in Georgia blueberries. And what we noticed is that flies were active year round. They don't sleep during the winter or slow down. They just stick around. And what more interestingly, what, but, but you can see in this uh, slide is that numbers were higher in the wooded areas nearby than the field themselves for the most part of the year. So it means there is a, obviously alternative host to plants that occur in the uh, wooded areas. As you see in this picture, we have tall pines that are mostly around the blueberry orchards here or other uh, crops, including strawberries. But the understory is filled with several other species. And when we looked within those, several species were uh, identified where SWD females were able to lay eggs and complete development in many of those uh, plants in the woods. So there's something that we need to do to eliminate those to those alternative hosts, which will help in the long term. But for now, management is includes biological control, chemical control, behavioral and cultural control. Biological control, this being an invasive species, biological control is, is very complicated. A lot of work has been done on classical biocontrol by large teams of researchers from multiple institutions. After eight to 10 years of work, finally we were able to get permits of, uh, to release those exotic parasitoids that we imported from native regions of SWD, China, and South Korea. And several states are now building up the colonies to test, uh, to release those in the field and see 
how they will help control SWD. Currently, there is no biocontrol in the field based on our native parastols. All right, so chemical control is the primary means to control it. I'm just showing you this one slide, which was the uh, first attempt to control SWD back in 2012. You see very few options, primarily organophosphates and pyrethroids with spinosins. Now, look at this. This is where we stand right now. We have lots of options, chemical options to control SWD. They belong to several chemical classes, which means we have the option to do really nice resistance management, which is highly recommended because resistance has become a major issue in California uh, uh, in, in many cropping systems there. We haven't seen resistance in other states yet, but some states have started to show initial signs of it. So highly recommended that uh, growers implement uh, resistance management by rotating products from one class to another. When you look at organic management, that's where we are in trouble because Entrust is the only one that has good efficacy, but even that doesn't touch the line of a threshold of being good. So it means we need to add additional uh, non-chemical components to make sure we are able to control SWD in organic systems. Here are some sample management, uh, season-long management programs. Again, these are just a sort of a, a samples. The, the, now that we have several chemical options that can be included. And in general, weekly applications are recommended in organic systems. We have to make some chemicals don't have week long residues. We need to go back after three days to make sure we protect the fruit against this fly. When we have a, a, a sort of a decisions to make for the whole season, it is highly recommended that you start with the highest, the heaviest chemicals, which means the most effective chemicals. As you see here in first slide, the no intervention, in the second slide, started with low efficacy product and still fly populations sustained. They did not disappear. However, in the third uh, picture, when you see here that a highly effective product was used, it knocked the fly populations down. And then you can use low efficacy and mid efficacy product for the rest of the season to maintain that low level of populations, which will not cause economic damage. All of the products, obviously, when we talk about insecticides, they do have harmful effects uh, against uh, beneficial insects. So we need to keep, keep that in mind. Even organic products do have negative effects on beneficial insects. So we need to always keep that in mind. One thing we can do to minimize the non-target effects of those uh, insecticides is to spray during the dawn and dusk times when flies are active in the field uh, themselves, and we can basically expose flies to direct spray residues rather than spraying other times of the day when they are not active and then relying on their exposure to the residues, which may not be as strong and may not be as effective. So recommending it is recommended to spray during the dawn and dusk. And uh, the other benefit is that less beneficials are active during that time of the day. So that helps in, in many ways. Now, moving on to behavioral control, we have uh, tested uh, several behavioral control strategies. The goal is to develop a attract and kill approach where we have an attractant that can attract flies away from the fruit. And then we have a toxic and mixed in it to kill them by uh, the residues. So this one technology that was developed by ISCA uh, te uh, Technologies Company based in California, we tested uh, several years ago and it did show some promise. As you see, it, it reduced this, uh, it was 87% less uh, uh, fruit infestation in, uh, when, when this particular product was applied, which was an attractant mixed, mixed with insecticide. And in this case, insecticide was spinosad. Now the same company is developing these new formulations, which are even more attractive. However, the difference is that these new form TD formulation and uh, uh, OR formulations, TD in particular is the most effective. And this is just by itself, attractant by itself, it's sold as adjuvant. 
it is currently in EPA for consideration to be commercially available. Hopefully this will be available later this season or next year. This is sold as uh, uh, adjuvant itself and farmers will need to mix insecticide of their choice with it to use this as a track and kill tool. Other chemical combi protect was developed in Europe and several labs, we tested it last year here in the US and we found that even half weight of interest can give us just as much uh, activity as fuller rate of uh, interest. So, or even more in slightly more in, in some cases. So this is really good product. Again, currently in EPA to be considered for registration as adjuvant. And uh, hopefully this will be uh, available later this season or next year. Cultural controls, again, these are really uh, important. The goal here is to modify the environment to make the environment less attractive for uh, SWD. SWD flies are very sensitive to temperature uh, and uh, humidity. They don't like high temperatures and they don't like uh, dry conditions. So what can we do to change, modify the environment? So yes, in this case we can do, okay. So let me go through one by one by one. First, starting with exclusion, that's one cultural practice or strategy that you can use to cover the fruit production area or berries themselves, uh, keep the flies out. This is one foolproof technology that can use, but it is expensive. So, uh, however, some farmers I have, uh, this uh, talk to, they have repurposed their currently used materials in part and in part they got new materials to make it more economically uh, feasible. But once you have it installed, it does work as a foolproof technology to control SWD, to keep the flies away. Irrigation is, you know, most of the fruit production does need a irrigation system. If you have the option use uh, uh, drip irrigation as compared to the overhead irrigation because uh, drip irrigation creates less humidity in the canopy zones and that is that helps keep the SWD populations lower in the fruiting zone. Mulching is another way to control SWD. The principle here is that uh, when flies uh, larvae are fully fed inside the fruit they come out of the fruit and drop to the ground to pupate. If we have a black weed mat or some mulch on the ground to prevent larvae from getting into the ground to pupate, they will get toasted and killed on the surface. And that again has been a very useful way to control SWD flies in high pressure situations. Pruning is, is the other way to change the canopy environment but when you, we do heavy pruning they, but it does it allows more light through the canopy into the fruiting zone where flies are likely to uh, spend most of the time to infest fruit and it does reduce humidity a little bit so that slight increase in temperature and decrease in humidity does lower fly population in that zone to help with uh, SWD uh, control Harvest frequency is again important. If you leave ripe fruit out in the field for too long, that is very attractive to flies and flies will have more opportunity to uh, infest. So remove the ripe fruit as frequently as possible. That will minimize the risk of uh, uh, fruit infestation by SWD. Sanitation is again extremely important uh, because uh, ripe rotten fruit on the ground is attractive for flies. They will be attracted from other surroundings into the field if they have more of that rotten fruit. So keep the field clean. Any ripe, overripe rotten fruit must be removed as soon as possible. And uh, you can do deal with it two ways. Number one is either um, is seal them in the plastic bags and leave them for two to three days in direct sun, that will kill all flies, or you can bury them at least two feet in, in the ground to make sure that larvae or pupae or, or flies don't come out again to become source of infestation. Last part is the post-harvest. Once you have harvested fruit, 
and you suspect there may be infestation, it's always uh, uh, possible to, to control that or kill those larvae if you can store the fruit at 36 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for uh, up to three days. This will allow more time for you to market the fruit and also uh, it will kill majority of the larvae inside, uh, inside the fruit. All right, so when we talk about strawberries, pollinators are extremely important and there is a, a very little information about uh, wild pollinators in particular, which are extremely important for uh, pollination in strawberries. So, and strawberry yield, of course, uh, and quality is increased with insect pollination. And what do you mean by pollinator health in, in this system, which is currently uh, one of the major issues and we need to take care of it. A couple of things that can be, you know, part of this whole concept of, um, you know, how do we look at pollinator health? Pesticide use, of course, can negatively affect pollinator health. The bee densities, do, how many bees do we have in the field and landscape? What other sources uh, these uh, bees can feed off of? And then that contributes to overall a population and their activity in the field that leads to pollination. These are the, the key or general pollinators that we anticipate. The first one is honeybees, of course, and the other ones are wild bees that play a key role in, uh, in pollination in southeastern systems. So what we look for, what uh, is this kind of a diagram shows you the red, more red means more negative for uh, pesticide, more negative for bees and lighter color means better system. So first on the top left corner is, you know, more pesticides and the top down lower right corner is the least amount of pesticides. So that is the best one for, for bees. Bottom line, uh, when you know decision IPM is all about making decisions and when to uh, take management action is based on understanding of which pests are present and if we need to identify those pests how many of those pests are there what type of injury are they causing and how that injury translates into yield loss we need to know that by active sampling active monitoring of those pests and once we know that then we can get into making that management decisions. Then what management tools are available and what we can select to make sure that we will control the pest, but also we will not harm the beneficial insects or other beneficial organisms in the field. That is extremely important component of pest management. So now when it comes to management, there is a really important resource that I mentioned earlier is the Southeast uh, uh, Small Fruit Consortium Guide that is uh, uh, developed and updated every year for uh, the whole region. It's available at smallfruit.org. If you go online, smallfruit.org, you can uh, find this guide and, and other small fruit guides as well. This is just the last, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the last page of that guide which shows, you know, in a at one uh, page, all uh, chemicals that are available and which pests they are effective and what is the level of efficacy here. You know, E shows excellence, BG very good, G good, and, and those things are denoted. This is last, uh, one of the uh, last, uh, a few of last pages uh, at the end of the guide. So I highly recommend you using this uh, guide as a resource for uh, strawberry pest management. It has really valuable information. Another resource that was recently, relatively recently created is the My IPM app. It does have information about strawberry diseases and pests as well. So you can uh, download that available for both, uh, 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 both uh, Apple and other devices, Android devices. With that, I would like to thank the uh, my colleagues, Hannah Barak, uh, Don Johnson, and Sianika Lahiri, who provided some of the slides that I shared, and also 
my lab, my team, and uh, sponsors that uh, sponsor our research. With that, I'll take any questions if we have some time.